Hello, and welcome to our virtual event on equity and innovation in food sourcing. My name is Antonio Diaz, and I'm the editor-in-chief and founder of Life in Time, a reader-funded publication focused on global issues around the world through food. This talk is in collaboration with our friends at Noe House, which is a private workspace and cultural home for creators, innovators, and thought leaders. Speaking of innovators and thought leaders, joining us today are three incredible panelists who are at the forefront of a more equitable and creative supply chain. We have Chef Ray Garcia of Los Angeles, Broken Spanish, who is currently cooking his renowned Alta California dishes at Noe House in Hollywood. Um, be sure to check that out if you can snag a reservation. <laughs> we also have Jorge Gaviria, who is the CEO and founder of Macienda, who is sourcing heirloom and biodiverse corn varietals out of Oaxaca, Mexico. And we also have Aaron Choi, who is the owner of Girl and Ducks Farm, who is just the bell of the ball around Los Angeles chefs. <laughs> um, he is providing some of the most interesting and sustainable ingredients to chefs and consumers from his farms in Portland and San Diego. And finally, moderating our panel today is um, our Life in Time correspondent, Elena Valariote, who is one of our strongest and brightest journalists in our culture and supply chains. Feel free to chime in at any point in the live chat, wherever you're tuning in, whether it's YouTube Live, Twitter, or Facebook. Elena, take it away. All right. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, and thanks to our panelists and to everyone that's joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, I want to get started here uh, just saying that over this past year, uh, our foodways have undergone a lot of change. And um, that's been difficult for all of us in different ways. Uh, but with change, there is always the hope that it's changed for the better. Uh, and the people we're talking to today give me a lot of hope um, with the work that they're doing. And I think together they have a really good sense of the reality of the situation right now. Uh, as well as solutions for how to build a more safe, sustainable, equitable food system for the future. So uh, we've got Aaron, like Antonio said, who's a farmer. We've got Chef Ray and we've got Jorge who works with both restaurants and farms. Uh, so I think we pretty much span the farm to table spectrum pretty well. Uh, and I wanna start this conversation where uh, the food journey ends for most people, which is when we sit down to eat uh, and that is Chef Ray's expertise. So we're going to come to you first, Chef Ray. Um, you have experience working with our other two panelists, Aaron and Jorge, uh, sourcing ingredients for your restaurant, Broken Spanish. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why it isn't so important to you uh, to be so attentive to where you're sourcing your ingredients and to build relationships with uh, partners like Girl and Doug Farm and Macienda. Sure. Um, so, you know, when I when I first started in, in the kitchen, and you know, unlike or not unlike most chefs, I would say, particularly in the time, you know, I came in as a as a comi, um, you know, and my 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 input was very, not very well uh, regarded or needed or, or accepted. You know, when you first get into the kitchen, you get onto your station, you have a cutting board, someone drops off a case of carrots, they tell you they need it in ten minutes, it needs to be peeled. 10 seconds later, they come by and they're asking for it, you know? So your whole focus is get these carrots peeled, get this guy off my ass. Like, let's just, let, let's get through service. Let's, let's survive. Um, and, you know, in that, in that mindset, it sort of just puts you into only thinking at that, in that task at hand. And so I was never asking myself, you know, what is the name of the carrot? Where did this carrot come from? What is the, what, what is the impact? What work that goes into it? It was just sort of, get get it done and get that onto the line uh you know as i as i grew and you know in, in in the kitchen and started moving up where you know ordering the carrots sourcing the carrots making sure that they were there for um for the staff to use is when i started seeing like oh it's not just one carrot it does just magically appear you know in, in the walk-in or get dumped on your station um there's other options and, and there was a moment for me where i was actually kind of embarrassed where it didn't come with a you know from a, from a carrot but rather you know an apple where you know a purveyor um she was foraging and she brought me an apple and i tasted it and i was like holy crap like what 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 is this you know because up to that point in my life 
I had never experienced anything like that. And I say embarrassing because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a chef. It's a nice restaurant. We're producing food for people. Um, it's not inexpensive, um, you know, but growing up, I did not have access to those ingredients. I did not have, you know, that, that foundation or that basis for, you know, the, the difference between, you know, a, a shiny polished, you know, pyramid of apples at a grocery store and, and what she was handing me at that moment. And it kind of, woke me up and and from then it kind of you know through through curiosity and, and, and a few other you know um factors it's like you know what i need to be in search of that apple sort of chasing that high again i'm like how am i gonna how am i gonna find an ingredient that that is simple and beautiful and familiar but but still sort of knocks people's socks off and and that's been you know my approach for for cooking you know over the last you know I guess 15 years or plus when, when it's been my call to make of, of what produce to bring to the table or what ingredients to bring to the table. Um, it's just to have it be something that's, that's simple and familiar, but when you taste it, like, okay, there's, there's something different about that, that carrot, that corn, that, that apple, uh, and bringing that to, to the guests. And that's been really our goal. And it doesn't happen um, in, a, in a vacuum. It helps. It happens with educating yourself, educating your staff, um, and really trying to, your, to your point, connect with people who are of like mind and are of you know similar passion. And and that's been you know the the, the way that has led me to you know Jorge and Aaron and, and you know others who are in our in our family of of producers. Thank you. And yeah, yeah. I'm going to next to Jorge, who works with Macienda and Broken Spanish to supply some corn products. And, and uh, But first, we have a video clip that we'd like to do for you from the Migrant Kitchen so you get a little bit of a sense of what Macienda does. I mean, we work within, you know, the canon of there's 59 pure breeds, um, but there's tens of thousands, you know, and each each year we'll, we may be sourcing, for example, Olotillo from Oaxaca, but it's got so many different expressions within that one sort of, that one breed. Masina's goal is to make sure folks know that corn is not just corn. Getting to some type of consciousness around the realm of possibility for flavor through educating consumers, and then finally positively impacting farmers' livelihoods. Thank you. Uh, so, turning to you, Jorge, um, just as Jeffrey has been very intentional with sourcing the ingredients for his restaurants, uh, you've been very intentional with building relationships with your farmers through Macienda. Um, so, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why it's so important you, to you specifically to work with smallholder farmers in Mexico growing heirloom corn um, rather than just finding a corn supplier in the U.S. Yeah, um, it's a, it's, it's, to me, it was sort of a missing link to solving sort of an intellectual problem about how you kind of turn the system that we've kind of, we've come to rely on corn in the United States to take on its head. Um, you know, the, the, the long story short is that there, there was, I don't know if it was so, um, I just sort of fell down a rabbit hole and, and kind of just kind of kept asking questions. And the more I learned about the opportunities for creating impact and equity throughout the supply chain, the more compelled I was to, to build a business that supported that model. Um, you know, the, the long story short is that I wanted to start a tortilleria in New York that was like the tartine of, you know, tortillas um, and really kind of build this like cathedral to honoring a tradition that we don't really have a lot of connection with. Um, as consumers. And, um, you know, the more I kind of explored op opportunities in the United States, the more I realized that like there was just something missing. It was missing in both sort of quality and story. Um, and sort of that's what led me to Mexico in the first place was understanding, well, this is the, this is the, you know, the, the ground zero of this food way. I, I should be exploring it, you know, at its core where it comes from. And, um, you know, unsurprisingly, once I got down there, like the flavor was just a totally different experience. It's similar to what Ray was talking about. You know, I grew up eating these staples, um, you know, my house and friends' homes. And it, it was something that was like wholly familiar and yet completely outside of the realm of, of anything I'd grown up consuming or, um, you know, craving. And it ignited a whole new series of questions and curiosities about like what makes this kind of thing possible? Like what makes this amazing 
you know, phenomenal food experience, something that, um, you know, I can enjoy right now. It, you didn't have to look very much farther than the farmers and the people who are involved, you know, preserving this supply chain that they've been doing for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and, you know, I think that the more, again, more questions you invite, the more kind of compelling the story becomes, you know, these are folks who have been doing this for subsistence reasons, you know, for, for generations. Um, obviously, there's a really kind of deep cultural significance of corn in, in Mesoamerica and, and Mexico specifically. But, you know, these are these are people who, ironically, you know, they, they live in extreme poverty, but they, they are the, the, the custodians of greatest quality uh, corn in the world. And um, to me, there was a, it was a no brainer to connect what they were doing with chefs um, and explore kind of just the education that came with that and start to, to sort of, um, again, continue and invite, invite that curiosity to um, develop a supply chain that had never really existed before uh, in a commercial setting. You know, these are subsistence growers and for the first time they were able to create uh, an opportunity for surplus materials that, you know, otherwise. Yeah, and I'm wondering if you could tell us, you know, why it is, you talked about how the flavor of the corn is particularly special. Um, if you could go in a little bit more into detail about what it is about this heirloom corn, you know, why should people care if there are dozens of varieties of corn being grown and what would happen if people were to make the choice to buy more heirloom corn rather than industrial corn products? Yeah, so I think, um, I guess around the first question, I mean, the, I, like, I, I think we've grown up in the last 50 years in kind of a generation of convenience and um, it's really, it's, I think it, it's, we've sort of abdicated this, like, um, this active role in, you know, in consumption. Um, but that's been changing over the last, you know, certainly the last couple of years, it's become much more mainstream, but this has been a, a movement that's been in, in sort of the works since, you know, the sixties, right? Um, I think the, the amazing thing is, is that as a cook, you start to realize how much more control you have over your, you know, matching your own palate or the things that you, you naturally gravitate towards. So in corn's case, you know, there's a, there are a lot of levers to work with, but, you know, talking about a tortilla, like a tortilla is totally different in Mexico city than it is in Oaxaca, than it is in, you know, Korea, like be, they're, they're very different um, ways it can show up in the world. And none of them are more or less right than the other. They're just, they're just reflections of kind of, you know, diversity of taste. And I think um, for me, you know, just being able to manipulate texture and, um, you know, certain flavor, like bringing out certain flavors for certain occasions or certain dishes. You don't have that ability when you're just purchasing something that's been packaged, you know, on a shelf. And even if you're going through the kind of the motions of, of doing what Ray does in house, you know, every day at Broken Spanish, cooking this corn in alkaline water and grinding it with, you know, volcanic stone mill, uh, volcanic stone mill, um, you, you, if you're working with commodity corn, you know, you're really working with a sort of a very finite, um, you know, set of, of characteristics that have been. Um, it seems like one of our, our streams is having. Can you still hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, 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 uh, but yeah, I think I think when you're working with commodity agriculture, um, and it's no it's no knock on commodity commodity agriculture, but you know, you're you're working within a really finite uh, um, sort of. Uh, group of possibilities around what you can achieve with a finished dish you know you're sort of limited because the agriculture that has supported that was bred to kind of do one thing really well and usually that's yield um, and you know you know risk aversion flavor and the possibilities of flavor um, sometimes flavor invites a lot of other things like risk and you know you've got corn that's like lodging in the field it's got a little bit heavier of a density you know at the top you know, these are things that just like you know they're, they're bred out of the equation and so working with this heirloom corn at the root is something that really kind of gives you like anything else, you know, uh, what Aaron does. And I think anybody who's really kind of uh, curious about, you know, the possibilities of flavor, you're, you're able to access so much more um, that, you know, it, it, it sort of just keeps that process alive and the curiosity uh, rolling. Um, the second question, Lana, you have to remind me what it was. Cause I, I didn't, I don't know if I actually fully, fully got it. Yeah. I wanted to know, you know, if people are making the choice to actively, you brought up the idea of sort of a conscious consumerism, if people are making a choice to gear more towards heirloom products rather than industrialized corn products, what might that do? 
Um, well, I mean, I think for what it's done in, in the case of Masieta, I think there's a, we don't, we don't wear it too much on our sleeve, or at least we don't try to. I think there's so much education that's needed to just get people um, up to speed on what, what it is we're doing it and the food that we're trying to, to educate people on. Like the process alone is pretty overwhelming. The word nixtamalization is something a lot of people aren't familiar or comfortable with, but it's pretty simple. Um, you know, the truth is, is that at the other end of the supply chain, these are folks who for the last, you know, uh, so we've been in, in kind of in operation since 2014, there's a steady, steady um, source of income, you know, that they can rely on that it used to not be a factor for them. Um, you know, historically in corn markets in Mexico, if you ever had any surplus, um, one of two things would happen. It would either just go to waste because over the course of the year, or you know, the middleman would come in and You know that the 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 funds and you know that they they um, they collected on it you know at a market. So these are folks who usually would just basically chalk it up to a loss. And there was increasingly less interest for these people to want to you know maintain their farm. You know, you've got family members who then would leave to the United States, um, start working on farms or restaurants in the United States or whatever jobs you know they could get. Um, and as a result, you know, the total output in the production would shrink each year. And it's a major concern for preservationists because these are really um, special, unique varieties of, of germplasm, of, of, you know, biodiverse materials to work with. Um, it's, a, it's a concern, obviously, culturally, because there's a lot of erosion that happens in the traditions that, you know, once there's, there are fewer and fewer people to maintain them at, at home. And then, of course, there's also just like the food uh, sovereignty and um, questions of you know of economic independence that are obviously compromised in the process. So the goal with Masienda is that with every purchase we are supporting the folks who are able to do um, what they do. And in fact, they're the ones who are made whole first in this whole process. Um, we buy once a year during you know basically in March around this time, and it's up to us to sell that whether we can or we can't. You know for the rest of you know the next twelve to fifteen months after that. The farmers are made whole first, and really, it's a no-risk proposition for them, which is, um, I think, it's an unusual way of doing business in this model. But it's one that, you know, it certainly has helped. I, I think prop up um, certain pockets of, of Mexico that we work in, and and it's definitely, you know, I think the proof is in the pudding. Folks keep coming back year over year to work with us, which is an honor. Thank you. There's so much in there I want to get to, but I also know that there. Are Plenty of similarities between you and Aaron that I'd like to to come to now. Um, sure. You know, as a as an advocate for for heirloom products, uh, for biodiversity, and for educating consumers, uh, I think you know Aaron at Girl and Doug Farms. You guys grow a lot of what are sometimes considered specialty foods, um, and a lot of that what you've had success with getting people comfortable with these has involved educating them about what is a lot of people. Um, and sort of the distinctions between what is specialty, um, what are commodities, and what might even be considered weeds, depending on our cultural upbringing. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, and then also maybe give us some examples of uh, cool produce that has benefited um, from a little bit of education from you guys. Sure. So I'll speak to a little bit of the earlier part that you spoke of, uh, as far as there are some vegetables, especially among greens, that one culture may call weeds, uh, but there's some other culture in the world that's going to call them staples. And so in my case, having grown up with a lot of different Korean spring greens, uh, green vegetables, one of the immediate ones that come to mind and one of our earliest products is, for instance, different colors of amaranths. In Korea, for example, green amaranth is one of the most common, uh, what I affectionately call roadside weeds because they pretty much grow everywhere along the roads uh, in the countryside and pretty much everywhere else that they can find space. So uh, this is one of the earlier products that we began with because I remember growing up with it and whenever my mom would make namul, which is essentially a marinated uh, green side dish, banchan, uh, with uh, rice and some other proteins, this is something that I grew up with. And thought it was delicious, didn't think much of it. I know it's very nutritious, but it wasn't until I started presenting some of these things really early on when I started knocking door to door with chefs saying, hey, chef, we've got some uh, greens that you probably may not be familiar with. It may not work. It may work for your kitchen. Why don't you try it out? And 
soon enough, they were going crazy over these various greens. So we started adding one by one different things that I grew up with. So another example would be sesame leaf, uh, also known as perilla. These are things that I grew up with on a daily basis. And yet some of our best chefs in this country are going nuts saying this is incredible and, and creating all kinds of uh, novel dishes with it. And I started thinking that's phenomenal because what we might deem a noxious or invasive species here, somebody else in another part of the world and another cuisine and another culture has been eating for generations, if not decades, if not centuries, if not millennia. And that's just my experience. That's just my experience with a few greens. And I had to think, I'm obviously not alone in this world. What other crazy foods out there uh, are out there that aren't so crazy to other people? And that snowballed into our product line as we know it today, where we not only uh, specialize in Asian vegetables, but my favorite of all things, which we've invested a ton of uh, resources and I don't know how many heart attacks I've had trying to grow this thing, but we finally pulled it off after about three and a half years of massive failures, which is a Peruvian tuber called Oka, and you can see that on our website as well. And uh, again, that's just another beautiful example where, uh, from what I've read, there are something like 40, if not 50 plus different varieties of this magical little tuber called Oka in Peru, of which we have, I think, about 13 of those colors that we're going to try replanting and growing again this year. But whether there's 13 or 40 or 50 at this point, if our followership is any indications, there is less than 1% of people who actually recognize, let alone have actually been able to taste what Oka is like. That's including among our chefs. Yeah, that is pretty incredible. I would love to, first of all, taste the Oka and also to be a fly on the wall for these conversations of you showing up to chefs with these mind blowing <laughs> ingredients. <laughs> you can only imagine how much fun that is for both parties. Uh, and, and to that effect, uh, I do want to talk to Chef Ray a little bit um, because I know that he's had that, that pleasure um, and ask him, you know, what do you see in your as your role as a chef uh, and connecting people with food that they're eating and influencing them um, in the way that they engage with their local and cultural food ways? Sure. You know, I think I think as a chef, you know, whether you're, you're uh, you know, in the kitchen or it's the you know extension of you in the in the with the service team is that we we were the guest facing you know kind of component in this in this equation but it's really all the people before and behind us who have been putting in the the work and have that kind of dedication so you know i think first you know my role is starting off with with, with me and a commitment a commitment to to learning a commitment to understanding you know my impact within the restaurant and within the community um, and 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 really kind of having these these conversations, you know, I remember um, it was probably about five, six years ago now when I first uh, started uh, working with, with Broken Spanish and you know, I tasted the product. I'm like, man, this is this is amazing. I had some of the same questions that that you had, you know, sort of what what makes it what makes it so great. And then he started layering in a bit of the of the story. And, and then at one point he told me, you know, just about the, the state of corn just generally in, in the world and, and in Mexico. And he said, you know, um, and sorry to, to paraphrase uh, Jorge or, or put words in your mouth for, for a yeah, I can't remember. Uh, in essence, you know, the corn that is grown in, in this country is, is garbage. You know, it is just made to, you know, fatten animals quickly, fuel a car, make a plastic cup. You know, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I can absorb that, that message. And, and that's not necessarily what we say when we drop a tortilla down in, in, in front of you, but it's just that sort of thing where you have to stop and, and step back. You're like, you know, you're, you're right. Like, this is what I'm fueling, you know, my body with and have been for decades now when, you know, when I just go to the, go to the, the market and buy anything off the shelf, you know, whatever has the, the club membership pricing on it or, or, or bulk, um, you know, and so it starts first with within and you have to really 
buy into it because if you if you don't buy into it then you're going to be very easily distracted by you know whatever is whatever is new whatever is less expensive whatever is less convenient you know and and for for me as a chef it comes to you know dedication to you know the the, the partnership and dedication to um you know what it is that we want to 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 give to a guest you know and and I, I said it, you know, I say it to my staff sometimes is, you know, we're, we're in a point where people trust us to give them something that they're going to ingest to put into their body. Like we're not doctors. We didn't go to medical school. We, we haven't, you know, we don't have this great education on it, but we have a, a responsibility because of that trust to give somebody the best that we possibly can. Um, and, and that's the point where I start, you know, from, and, and how do we connect everybody is just, I think first off, you know, not wearing it on our sleeve, like like Jorge said, we, we we don't go to great you know lengths to announce what we, we what we've done for you um, or, or or talk terribly about the product until you know you've had it and you realize okay hold on there's there, there's something different here or what what is that thing in the Awachila that looks like a you know looks like a tomato but it's it's not and then we can know oh this is a you know this is a peachy berry and it's an Andean fruit and you know and and, and we can kind of go into those lessons that we were taught by by Aaron and, and his team you know and it really makes us feel good that we are you know educating in that way with the end goal of you know, people will now look for that pichu berry. People will now look for that oka. People will try to start sourcing for their own conico azul so they can have for the, for their tortillas. And I think, you know, no pun intended, but once we start planting those seeds and it starts getting uploaded into, you know, different different homes, different families, different restaurants, I think that's our our impact. So, you know, we're kind of the end point for, for some, you know, in some regard with the ingredient, but we're just the start for kind of getting the message out there uh, and getting it into people's homes. Oh man, that was, that was great. Thank you. I hope I didn't misquote you too badly, but I do know how strongly you feel about commodity corn. <laughs> Respect, I, there's a place for it, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Jorge, if there's a, if you have a question or if you, any of you want to chime in at any point, and it's kind of like a family Zoom call here, everyone knows each other, so feel free guys at any <laughs> Anytime to chime in. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, gosh, there's there's so much here. Uh, one thing that I do want to bring up is, you know, in a conversation like this, um, there is a certain amount of elitism that comes into any conversation that is talking about, you know, heirloom products and organic products a lot of times that we should be aware of. Um, and just based on the fact that these that good food costs a lot, um, that there's a lot of value to it, a lot goes into it. Um, but I'm wondering maybe if we could start with Aaron because as a farmer, he has sort of the practical know-how behind that. Um, if you'd be able to address at all some of the barriers that they that there are in making you know good food more accessible to everyone, um, you know, making good food affordable, but also making sure that farmers are being provided with a living wage. Who? Let me think for a moment about uh, unpacking that. There's there's a lot going on there. Um, as far as affordability, and um, I think with affordability goes along the issue of accessibility as well. And when I think about accessibility, Unfortunately, the most accessible vegetables, and I, I love the way that uh, Jorge worded it. I, I don't think art I can articulate it better. Um, the most accessible things that we have, unfortunately, are commodity items. There's nothing necessarily wrong with commodity vegetables in and of themselves, whether that's commodity corn or uh, commodity greens, commodity tomatoes, they're, they're everywhere. But I, I wonder, and it is something that um, we're addressing kind of in the back end, which I don't have time to go into today, obviously, with the scope of the discussion. If we can introduce better tomatoes, now, how do we define better, better flavor, better shelf life? There's a lot of different parameters we can discuss, but if we can introduce more flavorful tomatoes, let's start there. Mm -hmm. 
and we can grow a lot more of it and introduce it to others and essentially work on creating this demand for something better than great shelf life or uh, how many tomatoes can fit exactly into a case because when we're shipping tomatoes all across the country, they want 48 tomatoes of, let's say, for instance, beef steak tomatoes. It has to be 48 tomatoes inside that case because when you're trucking across hundreds of semis and there's one case that's not fitting 48, it's 46, 45, that's going to start eating into, you guessed it, profits. Mm -hmm. So if Girl and Doug can take one small step and hopefully inspire other growers to spark essentially something to the, the, the beginning, a big beginning of growing more flavorful tomatoes, something uh, other than the sole goal of being longer shelf life, mm -hmm. that might just be the beginning of creating a demand among the consumers for I want something better. I don't want genetically altered beefsteak tomatoes that are sold a dime a dozen at your you know big box retailers that are bred specifically for ultimately profit margins and not so much well everything else <laughs> that that uh, chef ray said we we're talking about you know ingesting into our bodies uh, we don't really get to see about all of the uh, flavor profiles as well as some of the uh, health benefits that have been lost through some of these uh, can I call them Frankenstein tomatoes, for instance? Tomatoes is but just one. And so, uh, again, tomato is just one example. We can talk about squash. We can talk about heirloom potatoes. We can talk about strawberries. Uh, a lot of different produce that, of the forms that are already accessible to most people, a, a lot of what it truly can be has been lost. And so we want to start bringing that back so that uh, we can actually start uh, creating demand for something better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, the, I mean, I think one thing that I really want to make sure people get out of, out of conversations like this is just how much hard work goes into farming, how many complicating factors are involved in, you know, determining the price of our food and the quality of it as well. Um, and I think that Jorge can speak to this uh, in an interesting way too, because he has, you know, this this experience of dealing with farmers in in well businesses in two different countries. Um, so I was wondering if we could turn to you, Jorge, and you could tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the international trade policies that have uh, that are in place between the U.S. and Mexico um, and that have influenced the business of importing and exporting corn. Um, and sort of what you know the obstacles were pre-pandemic, how that's changed now, uh, working between the two countries. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a trade expert, but you know, on a very simple you know um, basis, like the the elephant in the room in the conversations with with um, trade between Mexico and the U.S. is NAFTA, and 94, 1994 was the watershed moment when NAFTA was passed, and the the ceiling was really just lifted off of what um, you know, essentially the U.S. could dump into Mexico, including but not limited to like massive amounts of corn um, that mostly went to feed the livestock industry, though, you know, there was concerns that this was also kind of infiltrating the kind of the, the actual consumer market um, for tortillas. And, um, you know, the truth is, is that people look to NAFTA as sort of this moment that re, re um, I don't know, it just, it's sort of obliterated, you know, an evil, even playing field um, as far as agriculture especially is concerned. But, you know, it had been happening in, for a long time. Like it was already kind of in the works and I think it just sort of acknowledged what had been there all along and made it a lot easier to do. So um, one of the effects of this was that, you know, obviously a lot of workers, um, particularly farmers, couldn't compete with the, you know, the, the cheap pricing of commodity agriculture and it was flooding the market. And so a lot really sort of just voted with their feet and cross the border to find other opportunities, not just because of NAFTA necessarily. I mean, like there is an allure of capitalism and, you know, a better life and safety and lots of things that go into these considerations. It's, it's not just black and white, um, but, you know, an easy target is NAFTA and certainly enough people have left as a result of just economic instability that, that was exacerbated by NAFTA. 
Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, you've got this this dynamic that's occurring, you know, for decades. It's still sort of happening with the kind of the recent trade revisions that have been made after the Trump administration. And um, the interesting thing with what I, you know, with Masienda was that this trade allows basically a really free exchange of, of agricultural products across the border, uh, including corn. And I thought just like, how ironic is this um, <laughs> that we're, we're basically now importing corn um, from Mexico to the United States, which is the green capital of the world. Like corn, uh, as far as corn consumption or corn, corn consumption and uh, output, it just like, on multiple levels, it just exceed any country by a long shot. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's pretty amazing that it's facilitated this this um, you know this kind of exchange in a in, in different direction. Um, it's certainly a drop in the bucket compared to what most uh, you know <laughs> the average like trailer load is crossing the the border in the other direction. We 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 are pretty small um, to say the least. But it is really encouraging that we can use those same laws. Um, and, you know, trade uh, agreements to really benefit folks, um, you know, as opposed to just hindering what they do and, and um, being a part of the problem. Yeah, and I wanted to ask about the, uh, the agricultural systems that you work with as well. The farmers that you have there, I think it's really fascinating to know what about their way of growing corn in particular differs from how a lot of corn in America is grown. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the, the milpa Correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, yeah, system it's cut out, but I think you said Milpa, and that sounded great. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the the amazing thing is is that so the values that underpin the company uh, Masienda is that you know as far as sourcing is concerned, we pursue the best flavor possible. But you know there are three key values that that we look at, and ironically, flavor is dependent on all three of these values. Um, or as it happens, they're, they're they're dependent on all three of these values. The first is obviously supporting an independent farmer. The second is the you know environmental sustainability of the practice you know of agriculture that they that they um, you know conduct. And then the you know, the third is that we're supporting a really broad range of biodiversity and materials that we source from, so that we're not just sort of you know encouraging the development of a monoculture like we do here uh, in the United States. Um, the amazing thing is is that you know those were kind of the, those were the 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 characteristics or the criteria that I was looking at when it came to developing the supply chain for this tortilla that never started until, you know, we all do our own like community service uh, that we do at the end of this pandemic when we all get back together. We'll do this. Ray and I are going to launch that. Um, it's going to be great. But um, the the truth is, is that all of these farmers had been doing this their whole life. You know, like, like this is generations. Like as uh, as as Aaron was talking about, there's a whole history of like, a better way of doing something and consuming something, um, and if we look closely enough, um, and though it's sort of anathema to what we do with corn in the U.S., farmers were already preserving a system of of sustainable. It's like it's it's like oxymoronical to even say sustainable corn production, but it's like it is. You know, they're growing it alongside uh, companion crops like beans and squash, which, you know, help regenerate soil uh, health. Um, they are, uh, you know, obviously also when consumed together or something that is incredibly nutritious and represents a complete um, sort of balanced diet. And so, you know, it wasn't really hard to check the box for sustainability because these farmers are doing the right thing. On a sort of a more somber note, you know, they also don't have a lot of money and, you know, you don't have money to buy a lot of the inputs that you need for large-scale agriculture, you know, anywhere in the, in the world, including the U.S. So a lot of people are like, you know, how are you how are you maintaining that folks aren't using pesticides? And you know, it, the reality is that most folks just can't afford it. It's just a it's it's an issue of access as well, um, and uh, you know, it is certainly something that is ultimately a benefit, but um, it's a reality just that farmers who are living, at, you know, at this at this um, scale of agriculture in this part of the world, it's just not a, it's not a, a you know, um, event. Um, and then, you know, we also focus in, in states where there's a really high concentration of biodiversity. Um, you know, in Waka alone, it's one of the smallest states in Mexico, but it has, you know, in terms of just overall diversity of culture and, and um, you know, plant culture, and it, it's, it's the most of any state you know, pound for pound, without a doubt. Like of of corn, I think thirty five of the fifty nine land races of corn um, are originate in Oaxaca. They are endemic to Oaxaca. Um, 
uh, you know, of, of traditional cultures and indigenous cultures. It has the, I think it's 11, uh, 11 indigenous, different indigenous cultures exist within the country. I mean, there's so, or in the state, there's just such a biodiversity um, overall that help preserve that material. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of just built into the, 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 the culture of how things are done. So it makes what we do much easier. Um, but, you know, we have to be really intentional about selecting for communities that are, you know, represent an opportunity of impact across all of those, those criteria. Mm -hmm. And continuing on the topic of biodiversity, I'd like to come to Aaron. Uh, I know that uh, we've just been talking about farming and you know plenty about biodiversity on your plot of land. So I'd love to hear about uh, your farming philosophy, sort of what goes into your uh, decision process for selecting which crops you're growing and then, uh, you know, what it is that motivates you to grow so many different kinds of crops, given the, the additional challenges that come, especially with these unusual varieties that you plant? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little here. Um, I, I've got these. <laughs> so uh, on my right hand, I've got essentially what is commonly called Cape Gooseberry. And uh, let's... I won't go into how if you call this a gooseberry, you're going to get banned from Girl and Doug Farm because at the end of the day, this is a ground cherry and it's got a lot of different names, um, everything from husk cherry to ground cherry and whatnot. And then on my left hand, I've got a Peruvian ground cherry, aka peachy berry that Chef Ray mentioned earlier. So why am I doing this to you all? Because the internet has not yet figured out how to transmit taste or smell uh, digitally yet. So why am I doing this to you? I'm not torturing anyone, any one of our viewers, I promise. Uh, but here they are. Now, when I would show up to pitches or sales or just talking about products and I pull out, I've got a couple more here. I pull out a handful of these, almost immediately one of the first reactions I get from chefs or uh, customers in general are, oh, uh, gooseberries, I love those. And I mean, I'm, I'm joking about you know banning people, half joking anyway, about banning people for calling these things uh, uh, gooseberries. But there's a certain element of education, consumer education that goes along with unique, exclusive, uh, new varieties. And um, there isn't really, or rather the most effective way for us to be able to discover, share, farm, and keep trying our hand at new varieties is through our direct connections with chefs like Chef Ray. Uh, he invariably took a chance on building an entire dish around something called squashini, which happens to be a Korean summer squash that's essentially the, when it's full grown, it's about the size of a football and it's literally compressed in our incubated grow bags so that it's actually about the size of a really fat cucumber. All that flavor, all that nutrition of something this big is literally compressed into something that fits in the palm of your hand. And without that special connection to chefs who are not only willing to take the risk to build a dish around it, but actually really get into the history and the um, peculiarities of that particular ingredient, we're going to have a harder time trying to introduce uh, the tenets of biodiversity to the masses. I mean, we, we talk about farm to table, farm to fork. I mean, that's been kind of the cliche phrase that's been thrown around, sometimes to great effect, sometimes really nothing more than a catchphrase to, you know, slap on a menu or uh, toss out a, as, a, as a buzzword. But I think that statement is incomplete because in order for, and this kind of touches back to one of the things that I mentioned earlier about how do we get a greater, not only diversity, but uh, accessibility of really helpful ingredients out to the masses, well, that's going to happen through what I envision as something that's more akin to farm to pan to fork. Farm, that's us. We'll invest resources, we'll uh, 
literally take what we've earned and put it right back into the field and try and hand our brand new things out there. But then that has to actually make its way out to pan, essentially the equivalent of the chefs and everything they do, because how they transform a very simple ingredient, that could be something as common as a tomato, that could be something as novel as a giant Peruvian ground, cher ground cherry, chefs are the most effective ambassadors. And I, I'm, a, I'm using the term more of, uh, not as a, a branding, but actually more of an advocate who actually takes these brand new ingredients, transform it into something that is accessible and more familiar to the consumer. And therein lies our connection to the table slash fork end of the spectrum. And without having that careful connection stage to stage, our ability to introduce new things is exponentially more difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, you brought up here the importance of having and what it, we hope, you know, is conveyed in this is that it has to be everyone involved, the whole supply chain from, you know, from the grower to the consumer. And I think that, you know, we've got the farmer, the supplier, the chef here, and the food system can't be the individual components on its own, otherwise it gets broken up. Uh, and there's a disconnect between the growers and the eaters. Um, you know, we've talked about a little bit, you know, farming is unpredictable. Uh, and I think that the supply chain that we have now, uh, the modern industrial su agricultural supply chain uh, shields consumers from that largely, uh, so that they can come to expect the produce that they want at the uh, supermarket uh, any time of the year. Same goes for their favorite dishes at restaurants. Um, and so, you know, we, we experienced a little change in that over the past year with the pandemic uh, in terms of, you know, my, people might have seen for the first time a supply chain disruption in the form of flower aisles being empty at the grocery store. Um, but, you know, it, these flaws and weaknesses in the, in the system have been exposed. Um, but I think we need to assess what ways we can adjust consumer expectations a little bit. Um, so I'd like Chef Ray, if you could weigh in here, because I think that, you know, as, as the chef at the you know, middle section of the farm to pan to fork that uh, Aaron brought up, you could speak to this. Um, just what you think, you know, we need to do to adjust consumer expectations um, so that people are accepting of new ingredients and dishes. Sure. You know, I think, you know, first and not to go too far off topic, but to look at the the idea of the, the consumer and, and, and who they are, because I think, you know, for purposes of this conversation, or at least a lot of what people assume is like the consumer is the person who is coming to the restaurant, swiping their credit card or putting, you know, something in their in their card on online and, and purchasing it. And when I look at a consumer, um, I take it a little bit more literally and looking at you know, who's actually consuming this food um, and at what stage are we introducing them to it? Um, and I think that there's a, a whole lot of impact in, in kind of adjusting that focus towards not just as people who are coming into, into my restaurant, uh, because, you know, quite frankly, if, if you're coming to Broken Spanish and you're coming to, um, um, you know, uh, a pop-up or any, any sort of nicer restaurant, chances are you're not struggling with, ideas of food insecurity and accessibility and education you know you you are kind of cross that line already and you're more of a, a connoisseur and you can appreciate what we're doing at a, at a different level you know what i would like to see is for us to kind of zoom out a, a little bit and, and catch a little bit earlier because you know it, it comes down to you know your I guess your, your your perspective and your environment, even within my my own life, you know, um, where I where I grew up as a as a kid and what I was introduced to from a culinary standpoint is a world different than you know where I am now and what I'm introducing you know my son to, um, you know, growing up, you know, healthy was the idea of drinking a diet coke instead of a a, a regular coke, you know, or something on the box said said low fat or, or low sugar and so oh, okay that's great we're going to eat this processed item instead of another but because of you know the, the the financial constraints within our family the fact that you know my parents were, were working all the time because of the schools I was going to you know that that 
great thing was an introduction of a vending machine for, for ease and, and access. So I think that we really need to look to kind of take that idea of consumer way back and, and say, how can we how, how can we start introducing this on a grander scale um, and earlier? Because, you know, I, I love, you know, Los Angeles, you know, where, where we live, where, where I'm from. And there is such great, you know, diversity. And, and I think we oftentimes get praised for our diversity. But diversity does not mean equality. Diversity does not mean equal access. You know, and I think that if we can start introducing more of these products, or at least the idea that they're they're out there and giving people the tools to to search for them, then then, then that's where we're going to have a, a a greater impact. Uh, because you know there are I, I work with, with with children at least when I have have time. You know I've worked with with elementary school to high school students to try to kind of impact and interject and sort of intersect some of their some of their thinking and and it are, there's a huge disparity between you know some you know, some students who, I, who I've worked with and I've gone to their their garden and I'm I'm impressed with their knowledge of heirloom tomatoes and they're talking to me about recipes of you know fermentation and pickling and what they do from their in their home gardens and I'm like I'm 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 you know um, not not only am I impressed I'm sort of motivated as a chef to step up my game you know and then the same time you know a week later I will be de- dealing with a a group of kids from an after school program and I'll say who likes to cook at home and I'll get people to raise their hand and they say what do you like to eat and they say well we boil some like spaghetti and we put sugar on it and then sometimes we put a little bit of milk and I'm like whoa that, like that is totally you know different and and we're not talking different countries we're talking different sides of the 110 freeway we're talking you know different sides of the of the 405 um, and so I think we have to look at consumers in the sense of who is consuming this, how do we get them the right food, and how do we set them along the, the, the way? Um, I don't know if I even answered the question that you were originally asking, but um, yeah, that's that's sort of my thought. No, was there, what, what, was the, what was the actual question, Elena? Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it was the, I think you answered a lot of questions in there and basically got at the, the idea here that we're just saying it consumer expectations, you know, in introducing people to new ingredients, Aaron and Jorge all works to sort of educate people about, yeah, about welcoming other ingredients, working with seasonality, um, accepting that at the supermarket and at restaurants, they might not always have exactly what you want, but being okay with it. Yeah, I, I think that just introducing the the ingredient and, you know, with the intention to make it the, the new normal. You know that the that the previously accepted standard isn't okay. That you know whether it's a beef steak tomato. You know Jorge and I also a, a lot of times kind of compare the the journeys and the path of corn and, and and coffee. Not only because of their their physical relation, but the fact that you know growing up, you know the 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 importance of, of coffee was, was was nothing. You know it cost a quarter. You know it sat around for hours. You know it was just a way to kind of get you get you through your day. Um, you know, and now that that cup of coffee, you know, there's a line for it. It can cost eight dollars, eleven dollars, depending on where you are, and if you have oat milk with it, you know, um, and you wait, you know, eight minutes for a barista to, to make it. And there's this new appreciation, you know, that I've seen over my lifetime for 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 coffee. Um, that you know, I'm hoping that corn or you know other ethnic cuisines, you know, at a broader scope. Um, we'll, we'll start generating you know, or follow that same same path. Thank you. Um, and it looks like we do have some audience questions here. So uh, I think we're going to turn it over to Antonio for those. Make sure we get to everyone. Hey, guys. I'm back. So we have a few audience questions coming in here um, for our panel. I'm just going to put them on the screen. How can we improve the connection between farmers and chef? Word of mouth doesn't seem enough. And this is kind of open to the whole panel here, whoever wants to chime in first. I mean, I, I, I will, I'm like a bit of an optimist on this one. And I think um, I always use this example <laughs> of, of uh, you know, Devil Wears Prada and the scene where like she's, you know, Anne Hathaway is talking to Meryl Streep and she's like, you know, 
I don't really care about fashion. And she she does New Middle Street responds and tells her this like long winded way of understanding how this sweater that she took for granted that she's wearing um, came from this fashion show that happened like three or four years prior. And that culture is just moving constantly in a way where it's broadening, you know, um, it goes from something that's very niche to something that's very broad and mainstream. And there's a process there. There's a machine, there's algorithms now that we can add to that equation that are constantly enforcing, I think, these connections. And um, I think right now, there's no doubt that like you are not, <laughs> that, that at least the standard in, in restaurants is that you are you are very, very visibly working with farmers and you know celebrating those connections. Sometimes it's greenwashing and it doesn't mean very much, but other times, you know, in most cases, especially the cases of you know, the folks in this call, um, it's real. And it becomes something that people want to replicate. And I think we're at a point now where there's actually a really strong connection between farms and chefs. Um, I think what we need is sort of that next step in the equation of just sort of how does that translate to consumers and consumers accessing that. And I think that you know things are, are moving in the right direction. So I'd say we're, things are going well um, from my, from my uh, vantage point, but you know, it's a good Monday. I don't know, I mean, it's a good day. <laughs> I'll, I'll add something to that. Um, I, I agree with Jorge. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I, on the one hand, I think it's a little unfortunate that Chef Ray and I began our relationship smack dab in the middle of pandemic. I, I mean, his appreciation for and profound desire to get to know not only the ingredients. I mean, that in and of itself is a little harder to find among chefs. Uh, still, but there's been an upward trend in chefs genuinely wanting to get to know not only the, uh, as I said earlier, peculiarities of some of the ingredients that they're working with, some of the produce that they're working with, but uh, the peculiarities, excuse me, peculiarities of uh, growing it and farming it and getting to know the farmer themselves and then uh, going one step further to actually say, hey, here's the farm that ingredient XYZ is coming from. Um, I think that's been a an increasing trend, at least in Southern California, for a little while now. I mean, are we doing well? Well, we can always be doing better for that. There are a host of restaurants and chefs who go out of their way to credit uh, the farmers uh, and even meat, pay meat purveyors alike. And um, to, to the point of the question actually asking how do we improve that connection because it's already begun, uh, it, it's a long shot, but I think there, you know, uh, that, that connection will gain a shot in the arm, if you will, uh, with consumers, uh, diners actually asking, hey, so I, I heard about this, uh, uh, you know, magic corn from Macienda. Hey, I heard about this magic peach berry. Oh, look, Chef Ray Garcia is using it on his menu and actually have a more engaging dialogue, if you will, with the establishments that are using some of these and highlight them and talk about them more with uh, family and friends. I know that's a really broad stroke to um, brush, but I think that's a really big part of it. Okay, we have uh, another question here regarding importing. Um, let's just throw up on the screen here. How does one begin to import a product from a different country? For example, I would love to import naranjilla, tomate de arbor, uh, guanabana, and even corn from Ecuador. Uh, I know this is a very big question, but <laughs> is there, uh, especially Jorge from your end, um, is there a way that we could kind of answer this for Morgan? Oh man, um, you know, I, um, this is a, I, like, I'm gonna get lost in the weeds on this one immediately, but I think um, exploring what the trade agreements are with that country is probably a good place to start. Um, you know, fresh produce is a really hard one to import, um, which it sounds like some of these, all of them are. I don't know if not, yeah, yeah, that would be too. Um, it's tough. They, I would say, I would say to really understand um, how long these things can survive in a really inefficient way to start of shipping things. Um, 
would be the first place to start, and then also uh, concurrently try to understand what the what the trade uh, looks like between you know um, particularly Ecuador and, and the U.S. And, and kind of go from there. Some of these items might be banned, or they might be classed under certain things that have trade restrictions. Um, I would do a search on uh, on kind of what what's allowed and what's not, and also know the shelf life of each of these things. Uh, we have another question here. Beyond sit-down restaurants, how is the organic, clean food industry working with emerging, healthy, casual restaurants like Sweet Green? Um, yeah, Jorge or Aaron, do you have? Are you just working directly with restaurants like independent restaurants like Ray? Or, or you also work with like a much broader sort of organic clean industry, um, like Sweet Green, as Kelly's uh, mentioning here. Yeah, and we've worked we've worked with a lot of folks. Um, Sweet Green has had an interest in working with us, I think, on on a couple dishes, um, particularly um, though that was all like just as the pandemic was starting. I mean, I think there's a lot of interest in these these places, and I think so. The move, the point around the movement of culture and where we're at. The next step is, you know, larger scale um, operations that are able to serve more consumers, you know, at a higher volume, um, and you know that forces us to get really competitive on price and, and things like that, and, and think about the business model in a different way. We've worked mostly um, more with snack companies, like large snack companies and things like that, who are trying to integrate sort of new um, new product SKUs that 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 fit this mold within. Um, you know the the, the CPG world, um, and that's been really encouraging too. So just to see movement on that's great. But um, you know, I think it's it's just a matter of time before you know a chef that worked at a Broken Spanish goes and takes a you know more corporate job at a you know a Sweet Green or a Chipotle and starts starts basically making a lot of noise that these are things that need to change for for their job to you know to um, to stay on you know and for them to do their job. So it's 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 definitely um, it's happening. It's happening in real time for sure. How about you, Aaron? Just, do you have experience? Yeah, so um, we work with um, larger restaurant groups so as well as uh, some resort chains, and often we'll be asked right out the front, hey, uh, we're interested in sourcing. What kind of certification do you guys have? Sometimes the fact that, uh, so right now, we ourselves are currently working on our GAP certification. So GAP certification is the uh, de facto food safety and handling certification on a farm level. It stands for good agricultural practices. Now, does a farm that you know doesn't have such certification mean that you know they're ridden with salmonella? No, not necessarily. Uh, but um, the larger groups, obviously, from a liability standpoint, will want to see that at least we're in the uh, the middle of it, or you know the certification is in progress and whatnot. So. Uh, oftentimes, the individual group, uh, customer, et cetera, will want to see that. And so there's, there's that side of it. There's another group who wants to see that plus some kind of, uh, again, progress in or working toward organic certification. So I found that it mostly comes down to the uh, individual group or customer themselves who requires uh, either or both certifications. We have time for one more question here that just came in. Would it be helpful to the farmers for us to ask our local grocers to carry their heirloom produce and products? Uh, I'll, I'll go first on that. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I have found uh, we have another side of our um, our farm operations where we actually sell uh, larger bulk Asian green vegetables and uh, the more choosy, the more conscientious customers who would actually ask about, for instance, uh, uh, the different squashes. We actually have about four different spring, uh, excuse me, summer squashes that we sell. And uh, we have gotten feedback from our buyers from uh from some of those companies asking us to increase 
production on the following season if it's possible it's exclusively for them for instance and nearly every time i would ask why not because i'm just curious but more for hey this request is actually going to take more resources more time more labor and everything so i need to know if this is a one-off thing or if you see a particular trend and uh in almost every case dare i say every case that our customers have come back with like that it is because customers are actively asking for uh, uh girl and duck squashini or uh you know um, Girl, girl and Doug six ball squash, for instance. So it absolutely does help. Uh, and I would actually extend that even more. It's, it's an even more common instance that we hear from chefs who say, oh, you know, we've heard about you from Chef Ray, Chef so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, or some of our customers are asking if um, you guys do other things beyond just greens. So it absolutely helps when uh, consumers uh, stand in and advocate for of uh, the producers. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to what Aaron said and say it, it certainly helps. But the, the next step is that once it's in the store to, to keep being really vocal about it, you know, um, because, you know, it, it, uh, these, are, these are pretty perishable products when you're getting into organic and kind of really minimally processed or treated, especially in Aaron's case, which is like raw produce. Um, you know, these are things that need to move and, you know, evangelize not just to the store, but to, to folks uh, in your, your network to, to actually purchase that um, and to have a reason to do it, you know, once it's in stores, because, you know, shelf life is very, very, um, or shelf, shelf space, I should say, is very, very scarce. Um, and, you know, it's a constant competition for what's staying on and, and getting off. Great. And I would just say very quickly, I mean, whatever you can do to support, you know, where, wherever you find it easiest to connect, it helps us all. If you come to the restaurant, it helps Aaron and Jorge. If you, you know, if you're buying from Jorge or Aaron, then it helps them stay in business and be able to keep the connection with, with, with my restaurant alive and, and thriving. All right, guys. We are out of time here. Um, I just want to thank everybody who's on the panel and Elena, uh, our Life and Time correspondent, for joining us and for the thoughtful conversation. I also want to thank everybody who tuned in to watch this virtual event. Um, and a huge shout out to our friends at Noya House. Um, be sure to check them out. And like we mentioned earlier, Jeff Ray Garcia is doing a pop up at Noe House in Hollywood if you are in LA. Um, and you could also learn more about Life and Time. We have a membership and we're completely reader funded, completely ad free. We rely on our members to support editorial so we can continue to do webinars like this and also to continue our reporting from all around the world. Um, I'll also throw in our little link right here uh, to become a member. Um, yeah, thank you everybody who tuned in and to our panel. Thank you. Please be safe and 